We begin our meditation uh, in prayer this morning as we pray about living under God's grace, our new theme in September. Lord Jesus Christ, you came down from heaven. You did not consider holding on to your equality with God as something to, to hang on to. But you let it go. You came down to earth and you humbled yourself to be born, to live under the law, to walk in our footsteps, that you might obtain for us the right to be children of God. And so today we ask for the humility and also the, the joy of understanding and appreciating what that means in our lives as we live together. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. I don't know about all of you, but I feel like over the last few months, certainly since COVID, there's been a growing level of, I'll use the word tension, or even outrage at times over the differences that we have between each other in society. Now maybe it's the mounting fears that people have of, of COVID coming back of the second wave. And so that raises levels of anxiety. Uh, and it makes us have hesitant views about the different opinions that others might have. Maybe part of what is contributing to this fact is simply the fact that there's a U.S. presidential election going on south of the border that's really hard to escape from in the news, even up here. And we even have threats of our own election going on right now in Canada. Maybe it's just generational differences between millennials and, and boomers, between the between our children and, and what should go on with them going back to school. Maybe it's different opinions about how we should be handling the pandemic. But whatever there is, it just feels like the tension and the outrage have been raised up a notch or two. And that makes us wonder, are we all living on the edge? Are we perhaps living in losing the common ground that at one time held us together as as Christians, as a society, and so on. And is the best that we can do just to watch each other from behind a screen or behind a mask? Does that just add to the barrier? So what can we do to dial back the tension? What can we do to look around and, and feel better about the relationships that we can have with other people at a time like this? One approach is to do what a lot of Canadians are doing, and that is don't talk about those things. Don't bring up politics or religion. Don't, break, don't bring up differences of opinion about how you should deal with COVID. And, and if your neighbor likes a different hockey team, then you don't even talk about that. But if that's the approach that you wanna take, then be prepared to have lots of conversations about the weather. Oh, how's the weather today? or about the cute things that your kids are doing, or about the places that you can't go anymore, but that's gonna be about it. I guess another approach is you can, you can go online and you can, you can start to look at all of these things, but then you have to try your hardest to avoid all the outrage and the tension that's going on online. And even if you succeed, what you might end up doing is just finding all the people who agree with you, or if not, you come away feeling this tension even more. Believe it or not, in the early days of the Christian church, God offered the people an approach on dealing with their many differences between them. Because even in those days, at least in the province of Galatia, where Paul wrote the second lesson that we're considering today, there were a lot of differences between the people. Some of them we can easily relate to, like the differences between men and women and how we should get along with the other gender in, in, the, in society, in life. But they also had cultural differences, real challenges between Jews, those who followed the Old Testament ceremonial laws, and those who were com coming to Christ but had no connection to that, the Gentiles or the Greeks or those who adopted the Roman culture of the day. 
And they had, they had tensions between economic classes, just as we do today, between the rich, the nobility, those who owned land, and the merchants and had lots of money, and the lower classes, including the slaves. And all of these tensions were right in the Christian's face as they would come together in this place that we call the church. So how did they deal with it? Paul addresses this topic in lots of places in his writings, and it just so happens that this month, those are the kind of lessons that, that come up in our appointed second lesson. So we're going to look at that. We're going to see how living under God's grace, this beautiful message that all of us are saved, not by who we are or where we come from or our background or what we even do, but by the mercy and love that God gives us. And what that does for us is allows us, today especially, to see how under God's grace and through baptism, God actually washes our differences away. Now, it's a short lesson. I'll just read the whole thing for you probably more than once this morning. But, but let's read it now from Galatians chapter 3. So in Christ Jesus... You are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Even in the midst of this wonderful encouragement from Paul, you can't help but notice that he does list off here some real differences between Christians that were already existing in the church. Now, these, these differences were very real, and they were reasons strong enough that on a normal basis, some of these people, they, they wouldn't even be friends. They wouldn't even pretend to get along with each other. What do those who are in the nobility, those who are rich and powerful, want to do or even associate with those who are slaves? How could they treat each other as equals? How could they understand each other when some people came from this Jewish culture and others came from a Gentile or Greek or Roman culture or perhaps something even different? They approached life differently. They looked at challenges. They looked at all kinds of things in different ways. And maybe they didn't even speak the same language. In a way, these differences are so real, it's sort of like two teams playing a game. One team is following the rules of soccer, and the other team is following the rules of basketball and trying to play together. It's uh, kind of a challenging thing to do. And... We could say in all of these differences, whether they're the differences between men and women, we can't just brush them away. God gives men and women different gifts and different responsibilities. And so how do we come together in spite of our differences in the church and not only get along, but actually grow and thrive together? How does a PhD student or someone with a high education hang out with somebody who maybe never even went to high school? What would Christianity be if we could look at those differences and say, these don't matter? For example, many years ago when I was a student pastor, when I was a vicar, I was given the job or the task of organizing a camp out between two groups of college students who went to rival universities. The pastor of the other campus ministry and I agreed this would be a, a great idea. But when we brought these students together, and remember they're from rival schools, most of them had the idea that they couldn't even possibly be friends with someone who went to that school. They wouldn't even want to associate with people like that. Because whenever students came together, there would be name calling or jeering and Sometimes even a fist fight. 
But as he brought them together and opened the scriptures together, and they realized, you know, we, we do all believe the same thing. Something happened over the course of those three days that we were together, and they started to recognize that they actually did have something even more important in common than their school rivalry, that is. That change in attitude or in heart is precisely what Paul says God's grace accomplishes in us when we see this very simple truth about our differences. That in Christ, we are all, first of all, children of God through faith. And this this truth alone is remarkable because when you think about it, the differences that we all have with God are are almost unachievably brought together. I mean, think about it. Who of us can check any of the boxes of what God is? A holy, perfect, eternal, powerful, divine being. When we are none of those things. The gap between us and God is something that that there's nothing we could possibly do to bring down or bring closer at all. And if anything, what Paul was, was, had learned growing up as a Jew, what the Jewish, the, Jewish uh, the ceremonial laws in the Old Testament taught the people again and again is just precisely how big those differences are and how unattainable bringing that together is. I mean, for you or me to do anything to be like God, well, it would be easier for you to become the next heir the crown prince of Japan than it would be for you to do something to get closer to God. When you don't speak Japanese, when you aren't a part of their royal family, and when the only way to become the next emperor of Japan is to be born the crown prince of Japan. It would be easier for that to happen than for you or I to get into God's family on our own. But through Christ, Paul says everything changes. Not just that we can, knowing him, sneak into heaven, but that God actually wants to welcome us to be a part of his eternal family. To be a part of a family, in in most families, you have to be born into it. It's given to you by birth. If you want to be the next emperor of Japan, I'm sorry, but you had to be the child of the last crown prince. But to be God's child, that comes in a different way. Paul says it comes through adoption. It comes when when we are accepted as God's child because Jesus comes to us and says, I want to welcome you into my family. I want to wash you clean of all that separates you from God, the differences between you and God, to forgive your sins and give you my perfect life, to even give you my, the very clothes that I'm wearing so that you can have the royal robes, so that you can have the status before God that he would look at you and call you son or daughter and say, you are my child. Even more than that, When Jesus does that, he even says, I'm welcoming you into the very family of Abraham, the one that God said would be his chosen family. That through this family, all the nations would be blessed and that all who would be saved would be his descendants. That Jesus even gives us this status. Now, you and I, we see the differences between us and and they are a big deal. But they're only a big deal if we consider them to be a big deal. Like in that example of the students, they thought going to a rival school was a difference that couldn't be overcome at first. But to everybody else who doesn't attend those schools, we don't care. We don't say, oh, it's such a big deal. You went to that school and I went to this school. Who cares? If you have something bigger in common, well, then that kind of minimizes even takes away the other differences. For two of the students who went on that trip, a young man named Ben and a young woman named Jane who went to opposing schools, they learned that lesson because at that campout, 
they met for the first time. And later on, they put aside their school rivalries when they got married and said, our family, our love for each other, is a way bigger deal than which school we happen to attend to at one time. You see, when we have something even greater in common than that, the things that separate us or divide us, our differences, in a real way, it takes those differences out of the picture. If we have something that unites us more than than our language, or more than our culture, or more than whether we are men or women, or adults or children, whether we are rich or poor, whether we have a great deal of education or little education, when we have something that's even bigger in common, then all those other things sort of fade into the background. In a real sense, this is what God has accomplished for you and for me through baptism. Because in baptism, God gives us something that we couldn't obtain on our own, no matter how powerful or rich or educated, whether we're a man or a woman, no matter what we have, we couldn't obtain this thing on our own, and God gives it to us through Christ completely as a gift. In baptism, God accomplishes something remarkable. He gives us something in common that's so powerful that in a way, and so significant because now we are part of God's family, a family that will last forever, that all these other differences we have, they they don't just fade away. God says they no longer exist. Listen to how Paul says it. He doesn't minimize our differences, but he says in God's sight, they no longer even are there. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Do you hear that? Paul is not saying, in Christ, it doesn't matter if you are Jew or Greek. It doesn't matter if you are male or female, rich or a slave. He says, there is no Jew or Greek or Gentile. There is no male or female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. These differences between us in God's sight, they don't matter. They don't even exist Because Christ has wrapped himself around us and made us one. Now don't misunderstand, the Bible is not teaching that when we become Christians that we cease to be men or women, that we cease to have an education or a background or a culture or a language or whatever it might be. It's just that when we get to heaven, those things are not going to be the same. And they are not going to matter at all, the way they matter to us here and now. If we consider how significant our baptism is to to take away, to wash away our differences between each other, what does that, what should that do, what ought that do for our relationships with each other as Christians in this life? Do you think that in a world where everybody's differences are being highlighted and shouted out and, and you, can't, you can't try to empathize with people who are different than you because we're different, do you think that maybe in baptism God is teaching us a way to approach the differences we have with each other? We recognize that our physical differences between each other without Christ might actually be strong enough that We might not even be friends. But with Christ, with baptism, with what God has accomplished through him, well, that really changes the picture. And it gives us the loving motivation to look at each other differently as baptized children of God first. And then to appreciate the other differences we have between each other as a blessing instead of a reason to stay away. 
even when we don't always agree, even when our differences are, are strong enough that it actually makes it a challenge to hang out, like when we don't speak the same language as someone else. Yet in spite of that, we view each other as brothers and as sisters and recognize that one day all these things that divide us here will be completely wiped away and we will be one, standing before the throne of God with our brother Jesus at our side in the eternal joy of heaven. So in this life, recognizing that we are one family, what we do this month as we think about what Paul says in addressing some of these differences and this tension is we can dial back the outrage, we can dial back the tension, and we can let the love that God intends us to have shine in its place. To appreciate each other, to learn how to, to accept and welcome people who aren't the same as us, to be this one body in Christ that God wants us to be because we're family through Jesus our brother.